Um, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Barbara Oszczyńska Ratajczak, uh, graduated from the U Wrocław University of Technology and Adam Mickiewicz University in Poznan. She obtained her PhD degree in chemical sciences at the Institute of Bioorganic Chemistry of Polish Academy of Sciences in Poznan. In 2013, as a postdoc, she joined bioinformatics and genomics uh, program at the Center of Genomic Regulation in Barcelona, and also became a member of GeneCode Consortium. This was the moment when she discovered her passion for long non-coding RNAs. Her major research interests focus on annotation of functional characterization and vertebrate long non-coding RNAs, including zebrafish as a model organism. Her research contributed to development of a new methods for full-length long non-coding RNA annotation and high throughput scales. Barbara Oszczyńska has published her work in highly recognized scientific journals and received prestigious scholarships, including scholarship from Minister of Science and Higher Education and Laurel Poland for Women in Science. Her research uh, is funded by the National Science Center in Poland. Uh, I would like to ask uh, Barbara to switch on microphone and, and video. Hello. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation. And please uh, start, uh, sh if you can start sharing your presentation and we can start your lecture. Mm -hmm. uh, before I will share my screen, I would like to uh, say good afternoon. Uh, I'm very grateful for this very kind uh, introduction. Also, it's an honor to be invited to participate in those webinars. Um, it's. Um, I'm not sure uh, if you if you notice. This is not my uh, my office. I'm currently visiting CRG in Barcelona, and for this presentation, uh, Rodrik allowed me to uh, to cover his his office. And uh, speaking about presentations, the ones that I usually give are um, designed uh, for narrow audience uh, with expertise in bioinformatics and uh, non encoding RNAs. So I wanted to make this presentation slightly different and more accessible by broader audience. Also, I, I have an impression that despite um, progress in non-encoding RNA field, we are still not discussing many elements of, of their functionality, and I would like to um, do it today. So uh, I let me share my screen. Uh, can you see it? Yes, it's perfect. Mm -hmm. So presentation. Excellent. So the dig digital floor is yours. Please start, Barbara. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, so are long encoding RNAs uh, functional? This is a very daring topic for presentation, but this is also one of the biggest questions of uh, modern biology with uh, relevance to, uh, to human disease. So let's see what we uh, what we know about this. Uh, central dogma of molecular biology explains the uh, flow of genetic information, uh, where the information in DNA is converted into a functional protein product. So in practice, this means that uh, DNA uh, is um, producing uh, RNA in the process of transcription, and as uh, showed by uh, ENCODE. The non-protein uh, coding uh, DNA can produce um, about 80% of our uh, non-protein uh, coding DNA can, no, I'm sorry, about 80% of uh, our DNA can produce uh, RNA. So next, uh, these RNAs are uh, translated um, into, into proteins, and as already showed by a uh, human genome project, only about 1% of our uh, genome has the uh, ability to, uh, to encode proteins. And um, it has been shown that a vast majority of, um, of DNA uh, gets actually transcribed, but uh, the non-protein coding DNA can produce various species of uh, non-protein coding RNAs, which include uh, short uh, RNAs that have a length below 200 nucleotides, and the ones that are longer than 200 nucleotides, and long uh, non-coding RNAs that are linear, 
uh, are my main uh, focus of research. So uh, um, lone encoding RNAs are mRNA-like molecules that are often capped, polyadenylated, and, uh, and spliced. However, they do not encode any recognizable protein product, which means that their final product is actually um, RNA. And this triggers serious consequences at various levels, including subcellular localization. So the journey from gene to its protein product for um, almost all protein coding genes is the same. So the uh, RNA is being produced in the nucleus, and then it's being exported to the cytoplasm where uh, protein is synthesized. For long encoding RNAs, it's, it's much more complex. Um, Lone encoding RNAs are much more compartment specific, um, as subcellular localization is the basis of their function. Uh, it's related to lower stability of RNA, which needs to be immediately delivered to specific compartment, uh, its place of action. And as a, as a result, we see many different populations uh, of lone encoding RNAs in, uh, in the nucleus, cytoplasm, also located in mitochondria. Um, and, and ER. So uh, inability of lone encoding RNAs to produce proteins also affects their identification and functional characterization. So for uh, it's quite easy, uh, it's relatively easy, I would say, to detect mRNAs because the sequence of protein can be translated back into a nucleic acid sequence of open reading frame and then map back to the genome. And this strategy allows with uh, relatively high precision, um, or relatively high accuracy uh, to understand, to predict how protein coding functions are encoded in, the prim in their primary sequence. Unfortunately, we do not have uh, such an opportunity for uh, lone encoding RNAs. First, we still do not understand uh, what is their sequence structure function uh, relationship. Mm, and also there are not many uh, sequence uh, specific and functional elements that could help to, uh, to identify them and functionally characterize. So, uh, and this is actually reflected by this plot. So uh, the vast majority of uh, almost the, the protein coding uh, set is almost uh, complete and the vast majority uh, of um, protein coding genes have been functionally characterized. Although the estimates for lone encoding RNAs far exceed the number of protein coding genes in our genome, only a small fraction of them have been accurately annotated. And uh, despite the challenges, the, uh, the annotations are presently uh, exceeding um, our ability to elucidate uh, lone encoding RNA functions. And as a result, less than 2% of lone encoding RNAs have been uh, functionally characterized. Lone encoding RNAs, uh, the ones that we know, uh, actually uh, use various uh, mechanisms to, to perform their functions, and um, some of them are, are listed here. So um, numerous lone encoding RNAs have been shown um, to be involved in crucial biological processes, uh, including regulation of uh, transcription at the epigenetic, uh, epigenetic level. Uh, and also um, they, they can regulate um, cellular uh, cell proliferation and, and growth. Uh, there are also some iconic examples of lone encoding RNAs with well-defined uh, functions, including um, role of exist in uh, dosage compensation uh, in Eutherian species, uh, cooler uh, role in regulating flowering uh, in Arabidopsis thaliana, and also malad ability to, um, the, well, um, malad role in cancer development and, and progression. So um, one of the greatest ongoing debates in biology uh, refers to lone encoding RNA functionality, and it can be characterized um, as a discussion between the drastically opposed uh, viewpoints, uh, namely all lone encoding RNAs are functional or non-functional. And the first view uh, represented by uh, functionalists uh, does not really, um, instead of imagining uh, our genome as a discrete set of protein coding genes with associated regulatory elements, it rather um, is being seen as an interleaved continuum of protein coding genes and uh, its regulatory information that can regulate genes in uh, cis and trans orientation, but it assumes that both elements are actually uh, equally important. While the uh, skeptical view uh, 
is, adh is adhering to uh, to function defined as uh, is adhering to selective effect, which defines a uh, non encoding RNA um, functional non encoding RNA as the one who is contributing to organismal uh, fitness, and it's under measuring um, and it's subject to measurable purifying selection. Uh, so although skeptical view does not really uh, deny existence of functional non-encoding RNAs, um, they consider the vast majority of them uh, to be not. So if you take a look at the, uh, at the skeptical view, um, it actually means that the, the vast majority of RNA, which would be produced by our, uh, our genome, would be degraded right, right after um, th they are born. So one of the questions is why to waste uh, non-encoding RNA? So first, the bioenergetic cost of RNA production is quite low, especially for non encoding RNAs, because they are not that long and they do not contain uh, that many introns. Also, uh, non encoding RNAs, as, as showed by those, those two, two pie charts, uh, do not constitute, uh, they constitute a small proportion of total RNA. So the, the at steady states, the vast majority of total RNA in mammalian cells actually consists of rRNA and, um, and tRNA. But maybe actually the RNA uh, can be important, even if it's not functional in the uh, strict biological sense. And um, uh, to be honest, I always considered uh, transcription to be complex, but not very uh, thrilling process. And it turned out that I could have been uh, more wrong. So the transcription, um, Initiates by uh, when transcript uh, when the transcription factors and co factors attract uh, polymerase two, uh, and then they enhance um, translation um, no, transcription of production uh, in by bi by directional um, by directional transcription of short um, RNAs before the polymerase uh, pauses. After post release uh, polymerase goes um, really fast, and uh, this is called transcription burst because it produces many non encoding RNAs in like um, one, uh, one run. So the duration of transcription burst is from one to, uh, to 10 minutes, which is, uh, which is really important. So here I'm showing you the uh, classical um, system, like uh, in, in classic uh, system in of transcription in mammalian cells, which includes mediator, RNA polymerase, and also transcriptional activator, GAL4. Uh, and, non, uh, and the RNAs, um, because they contain um, phosphate backbones, they, they are really, uh, they contain high negative uh, charge density. Uh, so it has been shown this year that uh, RNAs can um, regulate transcription, uh, which is very important because it seems that uh, the vast majority of the transcription condensates, which are uh, high, uh, high density um, structures, including transcription factors, cofactors, and polymerase, uh, their formation is actually mediated by electrostatic interactions. So uh, the, trans the formation of transcription condensates um, is enhanced when at low RNA concentration, where the, um, uh, where the opposite charge, uh, charges are being actually uh, promoted. So then the condensate uh, becomes stable uh, when the charge, um, there is a charge balance. And when uh, the RNA concentration increases, um, it causes the um, dissolvement of transcriptional uh, cofactors in non-equilibrium uh, model. So here you see this table is showing uh, the number of typical uh, elements in the condensates, uh, transcriptional condensates with uh, their corresponding uh, electrostatic charge. So if you compare the numbers of proteins and uh, here mRNAs, you will see a massive difference in the total, uh, total charge. So um, it seems that at uh, RNA at physiological um, levels can either promote or uh, dissolve condensates, uh, transcriptional condensates, uh, which means that although we do not really know the role of uh, the vast majority of non-encoding RNAs, it, some of them might actually regulate transcription, 
mm, of uh, of neighboring genes just because uh, of their presence, especially if mRNA is producing a sense intronic uh, London coding RNA, which is stable and it's not regulated in any way. But is it really a, um, a function? Um, so uh, the condensate formation is not really uh, affected by RNA sequence, so sequence does not matter. What really matters is the length. Um, and also the molecule type is not very important because uh, the same RNA can be uh, replaced by single-stranded DNA sequence, which is of the same length. What, what is also important is the rate of diffusion. So uh, slow diffusion means that RNA will be uh, accumulating close to transcription um, sites, which is, which is important for condensate formation. So uh, accumulation of RNA also is important for, um, for spatial organization of nucleus. Uh, and this year, um, actually this month, uh, a new paper uh, was published from uh, my, um, Mitch Gutmann's lab. And they showed that uh, London coding RNAs that are enriched in chromatin, um, I actually, they, they localize uh, close to their uh, transcriptional loci. Um, so you can see here the black ones are the ones that are uh, chromatin enriched um, and the ones uh, listed here in red are the ones present in cytosol, so they are depleted uh, near the, the transcriptional loci. So the difference here is also the outlier is MALAT1, uh, which is chromatin enriched. However, it's present um, all over in the in the genome, so it's not really clear what is um, what is the difference between MALAT and one, uh, MALAT one and the rest. But what is really important is that these non-encoding RNAs are really stable, so they have a, a stability comparable to uh, or even slightly higher than uh, mRNAs. So in this scenario, uh, if the non-encoding RNA is located close to its uh, transcriptional loci and stable, it means that it doesn't have to be present in high concentration just to perform um, its function. And this is what was uh, suggested by, uh, by Gutmann that um, London coding RNAs can, be, um, can produce high concentration territories in the uh, internucleus, which helps to um, he which helps to shape their functions. And they uh, suggested the mechanism where the formation of high uh, concentration territories, which is called seed, helps to bind diffusive uh, non-coding RNAs and also proteins by high affinity um, interactions and then recruit them, meaning they enhance their presence and actually um, shape nucleus spatially. And this is also um, could be possible explanation for long range uh, RNA, uh, DNA interactions. This model highlights one important function, um, one unique, um, I would say, feature of non-coding RNAs in contrast to DNA and mRNA, which means that non-coding RNA can be accumulated at high concentrations in the proximity to their transcriptional locus. So um, because mRNA is immediately exported to uh, cytoplasm um, once it's uh, polyadenylated and, and spliced, so it means that they, it doesn't have a um, particular uh, positional role in the, in the nucleus. And DNA, um, it's present in, in one copy and it's very hard to um, accumulate DNA at, at high concentration as it is possible for non-coding RNAs. So when we ask, uh, when we discuss the non-coding RNA functionality, it's also important to um, ask how are non-coding RNAs functional? So indeed, some of them are non-functional and have uh, like tra they are transcriptional nodes and they do not have any um, effect on organismal phenotype. The others are acting by uh, transcription or splicing um, alone. So RNA molecule and its sequence, it's not really important for, uh, for the functions. Um, others can produce uh, short unidentified peptides. Uh, and finally, there are some, uh, which act uh, as a RNA molecule. So the sequence and molecule are important. So existence of those uh, different functional uh, modalities um, made field like 
field started to wondering whether there can be a relationship between junk RNA and functional uh, long encoding RNAs. And although our genome evolve, um, evolves under weak re selection reg regime, meaning that uh, less than 10% uh, of our DNA is subjected to um, purifying selection, um, there are some other mechanisms uh, that can accelerate functional conversion. And one of them is um, constructive neutral evolution, which is forming new parts or new links between existing parts um, just to uh, produce new functional elements. And this strategy uh, has been proposed for London coding RNAs, which is also important that um, elements that are being used, they are called excess capacity because their presence is not immediately advantageous to, to the genome, but actually the, it can be uh, over time. And how it works for long encoding RNAs. So cryptic, uh, cryptic transcriptional uh, start site, uh, which evolves under, uh, under um, like which evolves neutrally, uh, can, which is intergenic also, uh, can promote transcription uh, in the, um, just to be able to interact with the downstream functional um, gene. So this is a CTD, so C-terminal uh, domain of uh, polymerase 2, which can interact, so which can um, attract chromatin modifiers just to silence the downstream uh, locus. So if this uh, silencing becomes, if the regulation becomes beneficial, then uh, it means that this uh, transcriptional start site becomes selected. So then again, RNA evolves naturally, uh, neutrally. It's not really needed for, for the function, but its presence is actually under selection. But this uh, non-coding RNA have an opportunity to explore sequence space just to gain the new, uh, new functions. And over time, it can, become, uh, it can become functional and then it's actually regulating the, um, the gene located uh, downstream. So it means also that uh, non-coding RNAs can see, um, I know I can switch to. So uh, long encoding RNAs, they, uh, this evolutionary model actually fits uh, perfectly the uh, spandrel concept. So it means that junk uh, transcripts resulting from functional transcription events, they are necessary by products of adaptive evol evolution. So this is like an um, intermediate product of, of evolution. But over the time, uh, over time, they, can, are, uh, they are accepted for new functions. So surprisingly, many new elements in our genomes, they do not really appear de novo, but they are uh, appearing from uh, rearranging what is already present there. So it's like, uh, our, I would say, limited evolutionary uh, tinkering. So as a, as a result, junk is actually not garbage as it provides resources uh, for evolution to shape new functional elements and, and further contribute to, um, to organismal complexity. So let's look at the long encoding RNAs uh, from the annotation perspective. So GenCode is the gold standard uh, long encoding RNA annotation um, because it's evidence-based, manually curated. Um, and also we um, experimentally validate our, uh, our models. GenCode produces only annotation for human and, uh, and mouse genome. So how we, uh, how we do it? So the sequence, the pair uh, sequence of human genome does not contain any information, does not provide any information uh, about functional elements. So what annotation does, um, it's straight is the process of defining functional elements so uh, it's actually like giving meaning to uh, to the genomic uh, elements that are there, and we doing uh, we are doing this by uh, defining precise location of uh, specific transcripts, uh, where we defined uh, also transcription start sites, exon exon junctions, and and polyadenylation uh, sites. And here you see uh, an example of uh, umlilo uh, long encoding RNA, which plays plays a role in uh, immune priming. Uh, and it's, I think it was detected in, in monocytes and it's located on uh, chromosome four. So 
just to enhance uh, annotation of random coding RNAs, which is very, um, very challenging, uh, within GenCode, we designed this method called capture long uh, seq, which helps to, um, this is a targeted RNA sequencing method, which helps to uh, boost long encoding RNA's presence uh, in the sequencing libraries. And this is how it works, that it uses oligonucleotide probes that are uh, tiled uh, tight oligonucleotide probes that are complementary to exons of non encoding RNAs and also regions uh, where we expect to, where we suspect to find them. Next, we, we use those probes just to fish uh, for non encoding RNAs and enrich them uh, in the sequencing library. And once the uh, library is enriched, uh, we use long, uh, long read RNA sequencing and short read RNA sequencing uh, methods. Long reads are used to produce the transcript models, while the short reads are used to validate them. So this is uh, this approach was uh, very um, very successful. Actually, we we managed to produce many uh, many new transcript models. However, it doesn't change the fact that the annotation is actually based again on the transcriptomic evidence. So no matter how much how um, hard we try, still the annotation will contain functional and non-functional elements, which hampers their functional identification. So the complete uh, long encoding RNA annotations in some way facilitate detection of functional RNAs because uh, by providing uh, accurate annotation of five prime ends, um, exon exon structures, uh, polyadenylation sites, and also um, the surrounding where we can uh, investigate the, the long encoding RNA features, including uh, sequence. But we would like to push it at least a bit uh, further. And we started wondering, can we facilitate the annotation of potentially functional uh, long encoding RNAs? So function um, in biology is inherently fuzzy notion because it can be, and it has been uh, identified um, at different levels. So uh, one question, usually what uh, molecular biologists are doing when they refer to function, they are asking a question, what it's doing. Um, however, I think we should uh, ask, we should phrase the question uh, in a different way, why it's there? Because this is a more accurate definition of uh, presence of functional elements uh, in our genome. And this can be reflected by, uh, by the example of heart. So when we ask uh, what it does, we are referring to casual role of heart, which is producing a beating sound. But when we ask wh why it's there, it's there because it's pumping blood around the body. And this is actually the reason why it was located there. So we started wondering how many conserved non encoding RNAs um, do uh, three species share, human, mouse, and, and zebrafish? Although the, the estimates um, given by other studies was not, were not very promising with six uh, human and zebrafish orthologs and 10% uh, of uh, ortholo long encoding RNA orthologs between uh, human and mouse. However, these estimates were mainly um, obtained using uh, whole genome uh, comparisons or um, just by comparing uh, sequences of long encoding RNAs, which as you know already, um, from this presentation, this is not the best uh, strategy. So we decided to um, use Syndeny, and Syndeny allows to identify uh, conservation of homologous genes and also the order of genes between uh, genomes of different species. And I will show you uh, how it works using uh, human chromosome 12. So uh, colors refer to different uh, regions and they have a, um, the ones that are present in the human chromosome 12 have a corresponding regions in chromosome 6, 15, 5, uh, also 16 and 10 in mouse. So it means that synteny can be spread in different chromosomes if you, if you compare different species. So together with uh, Rory Johnson, we designed a um, new method for uh, detecting um, positionally conserved non encoding RNAs, which is called a uh, connector. And connector is uh, synteny based, which means that rather than looking at specific non encoding RNA sequence, it is looking for um, conserved blocks of sequence. So connector can work in two different modes. 
uh, using uh, exonic and the genic overlap uh, using exon boundaries or genic boundaries uh, respectively. And this is to get uh, positionally conserved orthologs, which often have a different uh, structure. So what is conserved is the position and the genic neighborhood, but you can see that the structure and the location um, across chromosomes is, is different. So uh, we use gen code annotation um, for connector to, to, to start with, and we uh, checked how many lone encoding RNAs orthologs we have. So the blue, dark blue bar shows the uh, proportion of lone encoding RNA orthologs. Uh, the, um, the light blue bar uh, shows the ones in the intergenic regions and non nifted uh, which is a great fraction, great, fra great fraction, sorry. Uh, it means that uh, these are the regions that could not be lifted from one genome to, to the other. So HG38 means that these are the human non-encoding RNAs which were lifted, like converted uh, to mouse genome uh, and here vice versa. So this is mouse genome uh, with all the non-encoding RNAs uh, and regions mapped to, uh, to human genome. For zebrafish, the, the numbers are not that thrilling. So you can see that uh, the vast majority of lone encoding RNAs, um, human and uh, both human and, I um, know oh, you don't see it. So human, uh, were not really, uh, we were not able to, to leave them. However, there is still some uh, number of those that have an ortholog and are located in the gene, uh, intergenic uh, space. So uh, because connector, uh, and we already know that connector depends on the, on the size of the input. So the, the bigger annotation uh, you give, the, the better results uh, you can have. So we produce the GigaLink uh, catalog, which is the, the biggest human non-encoding RNA set. And we produce it by merging all existing uh, non-encoding RNA repositories. And we uh, produce the non-redundant transcript set which was collapsed further in the, um, in the set of genes. So the, the existing transcripts were assigned to, uh, to loci. And as you can see, so the top panel is, these are official annotations and the bottom ones are uh, giggling. So the proportion stays, but in terms of uh, absolute numbers, there is, a, there is a massive improvement, especially here, if you look for, uh, regions that are um, human non-encoding RNAs that are um, lifted over to mouse genome, but are located in the intergenic space. And this is to give you the, the absolute numbers. So it's actually quite a lot. And if you look at the zebrafish, uh, which has really small catalog with 3,000 uh, no, 3, genes, 3,300 genes almost, you see that with connector, we can get uh, many interesting um, orthologs. So this is an example of uh, human mouse ortholog, Elder. So you, uh, actually the colors, that, they do not match, but, but you can see uh, overlapping, uh, overlapping regions. And maybe this would be better visible for zebrafish. This is very important non-encoding RNA called Nesper, uh, which has a role in uh, gastric cancer progression. Uh, also, this example gives you, um, shows you discrepancy between human annotation and the one for zebrafish. But what is really important is that you get synthetic regions uh, at the transcription uh, start set because it's uh, transcribed in the antisense orientation. So th these are elements that uh, that can uh, that are actually conserved between genomes. However. Um, the paper that was recently published by Linking Chen reveals another level of comp complexity for uh, positionally conserved London coding RNA orthologs. So Linking uh, and her group, they look at uh, fast London coding RNA, which is transcribed in antisense um, and is located in the um, neighborhood of Fox Free gene. So what Linking uh, showed is actually um, differential RNA processing. So the, the same London coding RNA. I mean, non-coding RNA orthologs are differentially processed in um, human and, and mouse. So they are differentially processed by human and mouse cells. So in human, actually it's opposite, I'm sorry. Uh, so in mouse, uh, so mouse is on the left. So mouse, uh, the, the fast stays uh, in the nucleus, but for human, actually it's uh, released to cytoplasm and it's regulating um, 
BNT uh, pathway. So please um, just think about the labels in a um, reversed way. Uh, so I think uh, that annotation can be um, can be improved, and we can start looking at uh, positional uh, non-encoding RNA orthologs at subcellular resolution by combining connector, subcellular fractionation, and uh, and CLS experiments. So studying uh, positional non-encoding RNA uh, orthologs will also help us to look at them at high resolution. And this is what this is the model I would like to well I expect to see is that, uh, for example, in fish, uh, you will see the junk RNA like non functional one. Then you see that maybe in mouse it's it's becoming chromatin mod modifier because this is the next except, uh, expected step. And finally, it becomes uh, functional in, um, in human. But there might be some uh, human specific effect. So it, uh, it would be also good to combine it with different resources. For example, uh, using primates. Um, and there was a new resource, like very interesting resource uh, created by um, Professor Makawowska's lab uh, when they look at the synteny in, uh, in primates. So just to summarize, uh, this part, well, this the, the entire talk, um, it's obvious that some non-encoding RNAs are functional, while others are not. Uh, but uh, the estimates uh, differ drast drastically. I mean, the proportion uh, of non-encoding RNAs and vision as functional, um, it's it's really uh, different by, by group. If you look at groups and um, and other factors. But there is a evolutionary support for junk uh, RNA because our genome is uh, evolving under a weak selection region uh, regime. So it means that uh, our genome produces um, like junk, which is constantly changing. So um, yes, basically this gives us uh, a fuel for producing new uh, new functional elements and those initial um, initially non encoding rnas are necessary byproducts of adaptive evolution which fits the uh, spander concept but um, i think this is my uh, personal view that uh, we often forget as a, that as scientists we should disprove things so we should prove things wrong so we should use we should use empirical falsification so I would suggest that for non encoding RNAs, we should start with the hypothesis that they are non-functional and we should try to uh, disprove it. And uh, even if 10% of current non encoding RNAs will be proved to be functional, this represents a new wealth, uh, a wealth of new biology with direct relevance to, uh, to human disease. But also what is really important that recognizing functional significance of positional conservation is crucial, especially for those non encoding RNAs that have diverse um, sequences, so divergent sequences. And just to acknowledge, um, this is uh, these are the members of my group. Um, I put them in the order of appearance. So Monika Kwiatkowska, uh, Virgil Dekar, Anja Korach, and Marta Blankiewicz. I'm also uh, supported by Jan uh, Podkowinski and Natalia Koralewska, who helped me to supervise my interns. Also, my lab is hiring, so we are looking for a talented postdoc. And these are my uh, collaborators. So I collaborate with GodLab um, from University of Dublin. Uh, I'm very grateful to Rory Johnson, Carlos, Hugo and Panos, also uh, Catalonia, uh, Silvia Carbonell for her help with CLS and also Sprafish project. Carme for technical work and uh, Rodrik, uh, of course, for uh, everything. Um, EBI UK, it's a part of experimental GenCode team. I'm also super grateful to Professor Jacek Woźniewski for uh, his support and, and help. Uh, and also we say a huge thank you to ZebraFish Core Facility headed by uh, Joanna Dozian for help with ZebraFish samples. And also administrative support who uh, Agata Chmielewska and Romina who helped me a lot. And to be honest, I think these two could uh, run the world. Uh, so with this, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take questions. Uh, thank you very much. Barbara, could you unshare your presentation, okay? Yes. 
So it's uh, time for the questions. If you have the question, uh, you can use Q&A form, the chat on the on the bottom of your screen. Let me let me check. Uh, uh, there is some question in the in the chat, uh, but please use this Q&A form. Let me let me uh, read the um, let me read the first question. Uh, First uh, part, it is just a compliment for a very interesting talk. Uh, is it true that number of evidence is growing on the regulatory role of a long non-coding RNA on the miRNA and this way involvement in cancer development? Um, that's a very interesting question. Um, I think there is no, I mean, in general, the, um, the role um, the regulatory role in of long encoding RNA in cancer is growing, but there are different mechanisms. So they they can act um, solely just to uh, induce or suppress cancer, but they can um, I mean solely meaning interactions with with proteins and so on. Uh, but they can also engage microRNAs. And uh, one of the ways I could envision is that they um, they are precursor of microRNAs, or also they can interact using them as, uh, as molecules. So the number is growing, but there is not a specific mechanism for this. Thank you. And the, the second question, could you tell us how did you prepare a library of long RNAs and how did you conduct sequencing? Mm -hmm. uh, so this is uh, this could be uh, probably uh, better answered by by Silvia or Monica, but uh, I will try. Uh, so we prepare uh, full length libraries. And what we do, uh, so this is like the regular library for uh, Nanopore or uh, PacBio because uh, CLS method is uh, platform agnostic and then uh, you design the probes that are tying your long encoding RNAs exons that are complementary to, to exons of your long encoding RNAs or the regions that you are interested to enrich and then you simply uh, use uh, I think this is um, streptavidin and then you uh, you simply enrich for those and the enriched library can be uh, can be sequencing um, according to the uh, sequence a platform sequence provider i don't know if this answers your question if yes uh, um, and and, not, uh, and the next uh, and the next question uh, what do you think about the long non-coding rnas function as a sponges for me rna is it working? Mm, I maybe I'm not the best person to uh, answer this question because I'm very skeptical about sponging uh, activity. I have the impression that sometimes when scientists run out of ideas, they say long encoding RNA has a sponging activity. Of course, some of them they do, but I would say um, sponging activity uh, is something that I would envision more for circular RNAs because they have. Uh, bigger surface and they are more stable so if it's something that that should really sponge maybe circular uh, circular rna but i i think it requires further uh, investigate investigate yes and further work to to understand how it works okay i do not see more questions you can still ask the question uh, i would like to inform you that uh, that we have uh, both on uh, Zoom and on streaming Facebook around 90 participants. And uh, just the information that uh, your lecture and this lecture will be will be uh, soon on YouTube platform of Polish Biochemical Society, uh, as, as it is done with all other lectures. So if there is no other lectures, I think uh, other questions, we can uh, we can stop us uh, still there is so, something on quen ah, that's a compliment compliment very good lecture i fully agree with this opinion barbara thank you, thank you very much uh,